Well, good afternoon. My name is Richard Doughty, the Chief Executive of the, uh, the Cutty Sark Trust, and uh, Gresham have invited me here today to ask the question, why conserve the, the Cutty Sark? Now, one of the main advantages of, of talking about a ship like the Cutty Sark is that I can say without sparing any blushes that, that this is a ship which needs no introduction. Captain Moody, her first captain, said this is a, a ship that will last forever and so far he's been proved right. Although she was built for a working life of just 25, 30 years, here she is 143 years later on. That's more than almost fivefold her, her life expectancy. Famously, Cutty Sark survived a fire in May 2007. When I spoke to the, uh, the fire officer that morning, he said the ship was alight from stem to stern. I later discovered that the, the temperatures that the ship uh, was exposed to exceeded 1,000 degrees centigrade. And if there was one thing that came out of that day for me, it was that it wasn't just a, a local story or even a national story, it was an international story. The four corners of the earth were, were shocked by what they saw and heard on the broadcasts. I've always argued that Cutty Sark, the, the greyhound of the sea, is the best known historic vessel. And that day proved it to me beyond any doubt. In the week of the fire, the Cutty Sark had no less than six solid hours of television and radio coverage in the UK alone. But before I go on, I thought I'd better uh, briefly put pause and qualify uh, my claim that Cutty Sark is the most famous ship in the world. There is a wreck, not a ship, but a wreck, which is about two and a half miles below the Atlantic Ocean, quietly dissolving somewhere off the coast of the Newfoundland banks. I, I believe I'm correct in saying that uh, Kate Winslet and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio brought it back to public attention in 1997. You might recall the name. Uh, then, of course, as the professor said, there is uh, Nelson's flagship, well known in the UK, but awareness falls off at a, a, a vast rate of knots the further you go away from Portsmouth. And then, of course, um, as, the, as far as the majority of Britons are concerned, USS Constitution, which is unquestionably the most famous ship in the United States and is pictured down there in the bottom right-hand corner. But as far as most people in this country are concerned, it's, it's part of the Star Trek fleet. Now, of course, my tongue is firmly planted in my, in my cheek. But, but Cutty Sark is a ship that sailed to virtually every major port in the world. And there is something compelling about the name Cutty Sark. It actually transcends national boundaries. Put simply, Cutty Sark is known everywhere around the globe. Now, I understand that there's a certain distiller of Scotch whisky who took her name back in the 1920s, and I, I cannot deny that this spirit has played a part in keeping the ship's name alive in the international co uh, consciousness. But uh, that, I think, in itself is a measure of the, the fame of the ship. So this begs the question, why should a merchant ship be so highly regarded? Back in 1922, Captain Wilfred Dalman stood in Falmouth Harbour and um, watched a Portuguese brigantine called Maria do Amparo uh, come in and take refuge from a storm. That's uh, Captain Dalman uh, some years before he witnessed this scene, but this actually is uh, a photograph um, uh, of what he saw. It was an unscheduled stop, but nevertheless, I think, significant, because Dalman recognised beneath this very shabby exterior the unmistakable shape of a ship whose fame he'd known since he was a young cadet. And he was convinced 
that this was the very same clipper which had inspired him throughout his life at sea. It was clear to Dowman that uh, Cutty Sark, oh, big pardon, well, Cutty Sark, uh, Maria de Amparo, was um, in need of a saviour, and he was determined to step up to the mark. Now, as it happened, he failed to purchase it there and then, but he pursued it back to Portugal. It took a, a year of haggling, but he finally, uh, he finally bought her. Even so, he had to pay well over the market odds. And on top of this, he had to pay to have her towed to come back from Portugal. And this is a photograph that was taken just after she was brought back into Falmouth. But that was just the beginning. He had to go on and spend yet another fortune scouring the country to find the materials to restore her back to her appearance as she sailed under the British ensign. Um, and to do that, uh, he had to sell his farm on the Treviscombe estate. He also had to sell another uh, sailing ship, the, the Lady of Avnall, uh, to, to raise the funds to be able to restore Cutty Sark back to her 1872 condition. And, and that is uh, the ship um, shortly after that work had been completed. An incredible achievement taking place as it did just four years after the, uh, the First World War. I think Dalman single-handedly rescued Cutty Sark from the breaker's yard. And as such, he was the, the ship's first saviour. I think it's also interesting to note that his intervention meant that Cutty Sark was the first historic ship to be saved anywhere in the world since uh, the pirate ship uh, Golden Hind was put on public display at the decree of Queen Elizabeth I the, uh, the in Deptford Creek. Again, peculiarly, you know, just a, a mile or so from, from where she's been in Greenwich for the last uh, 60 years. I think it's also interesting to note that um, Francis Drake's ship didn't survive very long. Um, it was a huge draw, but uh, sadly people who went to have a look at it took a little bit away as a souvenir and um, sadly she, she sank to the bottom of the creek where I believe her remains still lie entombed. It's also a measure of her success that her name still commanded headline news. Cutty Sark purchased for the nation. And returning to uh, my friends, Barry Brothers and uh, Rudd, they were actually persuaded by an artist called James McBray to take the name Cutty Sark for a new blended whiskey that had been developed for sale in the United States of America. Perversely, that artist, McBray, was actually travelling down on a train from Edinburgh to London to make his pitch to Berries, and he read that very same advertisement, that very same notice, um, and took the idea um, forward, and uh, the rest, as they say, is, is history. Uh, Cutty Sark, uh, one of the um, best-selling uh, blended whiskies around the, the world. The Cutty Sark was saved again in the 1950s by His Royal Highness uh, the Duke of Edinburgh and Frank Carr, who was the then uh, sort of head of the uh, National Maritime uh, Museum. And, and one of the reasons why the ship was preserved at that time was so that it could act as a, a permanent memorial to the, the merchant service, uh, those people who'd lost... Um, Heavy, heavy losses during the, the Second World War. Um, this, is, this is a photograph of the, the ship being um, pushed back into a purpose-built dry berth. Uh, this is just a link that was created at the time through to the river. Um, the, the dry berth was actually constructed by uh, McAlpine. And since 1957, the ship has been seen by more than 16 million people who've physically been on board and, and countless more millions uh, who have uh, walked past her in Greenwich or have seen her 
um, on the, um, the television, particularly during the, the London Marathon. She's one of the great sights, obviously, of, uh, of that, that race. For me, one of the challenges, actually, of the project has been to, to try and find ways to make sure that when we reopen to the public, we're able to convert viewers to visitors, because, of course, you could always go and have your photograph taken alongside the ship without physically going on board. So, if there is something magical about Cutty Sark, which captivates all who see her, how do we explain this magic? On the face of it, Cutty Sark technically is not revolutionary, say, in the way that SS Great Britain is. This is a, a Tudgay painting. It's one of only two paintings that I know of um, showing the, the ship during her, her working life. She's not a landmark then, or perhaps I should be saying sea mark, um, in, in terms of the development of the, the ship. She has a beautiful underwater shape, it's true, but she's not radically different from the other clipper ships that had been evolving during the 19th century. John Willis was the, the man who commissioned the, uh, the ship. He was um, uh, well established in, in the trade. He went to a young firm called Scott and Linton, up in Dumbarton on the, on the River Clyde in, in Scotland. And they'd never built a vessel of, uh, of this size before, although the actual designer of Cutty Sark, uh, Hercules Linton, had been apprenticed to the yard of Alexander Hall in Aberdeen, perhaps the most innovative and prolific of the, uh, the clipper ship builders. This next slide is John Rennie's original profile and plan of Cutty Sark um, in 1869. And um, <coughs> you'll notice here that it's actually showing the, uh, the forecastle accommodation. So I mean, they were saying the, the Royal Navy, in the Merchant Navy, that the, the crew live on the, the ship. And, and certainly there's a cruise accommodation here with a, um, a galley and a shipwright's workshop and then uh, accommodation here and over at the stern in the, the Liverpool house which I'll come back to later on the uh, officers accommodation but on the the first couple of trips this area in here the forecastle was certified by Lloyd's to accommodate 20 crewmen this next slide um, shows the half-midship section of Cutty Sark, again in 1869. Interestingly, um, both of these drawings seem to, to actually predate the assigning of a name to the ship. The price agreed then, £16,150. Actually, it wasn't enough to build a ship of the quality um, of the, the, the actual contract itself specified. And Scott and Linton actually went bankrupt just before Cutty Sark was, was completed. And the finishing touches were made by another company, William Denny and, and Brothers. I, I've come, of course, what I've been doing for some little time now is dismantling the whole ship. It's been rather like a giant jigsaw, taking it apart and, and putting it back together again. And, and the Liverpool house is, is a case in point when I come to think about things not being done quite as you might have expected. Um, first, first glance, the master's accommodation here looks as if it could grace any yacht. Um, interestingly, when we dismantled it, we found that it had very obviously come from an earlier vessel and had been um, adapted to fit on board the, uh, the ship. Cutty Sark was built for the China tea trade. She, she carried about 1.3 million pounds of, of tea. That roughly equates to 600,000 kilograms, or to put it another way, she could carry enough tea to make 200 million cups of tea. <laughs> On her first three voyages, she sailed directly to China. 
Later, she would uh, go first to, to Sydney with a general cargo and pick up a thousand tonnes of Australian coal and then sail on to, to Shanghai. But as our, our chairman said, her career uh, as a, a tea clipper was remarkably short, just eight years. And yet under a particularly brilliant master, Captain Woodgut, she had another spectacularly successful career, but in one of the least glamorous trades, in the transporting of, of bales of wool. Cutty Sark entered the regular Australian wool trade in 1883 and found success as the last chance saloon. If you wanted to get your wool back to market quickly, Cutty Sark was absolutely the ship that you wanted to get. Her best record between London and well, between Sydney and London was 72 days. From there, she went on and was purchased by a Portuguese company in 1895, and her name was changed to Fiera. Probably worth again saying, um, you, you were polite enough to laugh at my 200 million cups of tea, but a cargo of wool back in the early 1890s would have netted about £7 million, just to again put that in perspective. Another very famous moment actually on those trips uh, happened in 1888 when famously the, the ship overtook the steamship Britannia, a P&O vessel. Um, and, and she became really a legend in her working life, I think, from, from that point onwards. People used to flock to, to Sydney Harbour and indeed to London to see the famous clipper when she was uh, in ports. So why was she able to travel so quickly? Cutty Sark is a, is a composite ship. She has um, raw time frames with more time cross bracing. Um, she was covered in uh, teak strakes uh, and she had um, rock elm lower down in the, uh, in the, in the bilges. And she was sheathed in a, a monk's metal. There was a, a prejudice, I think, at the time that um, metal ships, if they were carrying tea, that the tea itself might sweat and therefore uh, there was a sort of suspicion about the, uh, the new metal ships. The traditional technique was obviously using timber. The great advantage of the, the metal ship and indeed the metal frames of Cutty Sark was that you were able to have a much larger cargo hold. So this massively strong and stiff structure, together with her highly refined sh uh, sort of hull shape, was the key to her speed, the very thing that made her famous. But it was perhaps Captain Woodgut who established her reputation as the fastest of the, of the sailing ships, this sort of late flowering of the, the sailing ship. And this is why Cutty Sark can lay claim to being a unique ship. And I think this is key to understanding her lasting appeal. Cutty Sark is not remembered because she brought back tea faster than, than any other ship, uh, nor because she was a successful wool clipper. In the, and I don't think it was because she's one of only three surviving composite ships in the, in the world. Cutty Sark is loved above all for what she represents. It's 70 years since the end of commercial sail, and yet we're still enthralled with the sailing ship, a, a mass of, of white canvas, the ship ploughing through the, the sea. 17 knots Cutty Sark could do, fully, fully laden. Cutty Sark is a tangible reminder of another world, a world just beyond the grasp of human memory of a technology that has served this world for, for thousands of years and still provides great sport, that even today, out of sight, out of mind, uh, ships provide 
a, a vital role still in transporting goods around the world. Cutty Sark is a simple yet iconic reminder of the importance of the sea in all of our lives. A reminder that as an island nation, sea trade, not military might alone, is what has made us the prosperous nation that we are today. Furthermore, there are very few surviving ships which were so involved directly in trade, in industry, in, in employment, in the, in the prosperity of the country that helped strengthen international links. Even in our own day, she was symbolic of, a, of an earlier time when the sailing ship reigned supreme and clippers, although not the last word in sailing ships, were certainly the greatest development of the sailing ship in terms of speed. At the beginning of the 21st century, we're still enthralled by the excitement and danger of the sailing ship. And so we are enthralled with this unique survivor of a bygone but never forgotten age. A symbol, if you like, of, of bravery, of, of adventure, of, of pitting oneself against the elements, of the romance of sail. Cutty Sark is one of those rare things which are truly emblematic and intrinsically inspiring. Quite simply, a piece of history which cannot be remade. This is a picture of the, the ship in Cutty Sark Gardens in Greenwich just before we started the conservation project. Her beautiful appearance belies her very fragile condition. We've been working very hard for the last 10 years to find the right solution for the ship. Now, I have to admit, um, our solution is no longer the one that we originally conceived, but um, that's been the pattern of the, the project, development of ideas, uh, revision, and where necessary, compromise. In point of fact, we've been working to create not just the right solution for the historic fabric of the ship, but also the right solution to ensure that Cutty Sark has a sustainable future and that she's given the world-class setting that she deserves. Cutty Sark was designed to withstand hydrostatic forces on the, the hull and the loads of her cargo. She was not designed to be sitting in a dry dock for long periods of time. No, no ship is. Um, being sat on her keel has resulted in her hull sagging and bellying. And you, know, you only have to look uh, at, at these slides here. You can see where the shores and the props were pushing into the, the, the fabric of the ship. They were physically... Uh, distorting her shape. As it was, I think we caught her just in time. Her iron framework, look at, look at that, is, is far too fragile now to, to take the weight of her, her planks. This is the stern of the, uh, the ship um, once we've removed the concrete ballast. Uh, these are the, the floors as you progress through, they just become non-existent. These are the, the wrought iron frames, uh, although perhaps not particularly evocative, this, uh, this image. It really did look like the sort of mouth of a dragon when you were standing close, these jagged um, remains of the, uh, of the frames of, of, of Cutty Sark. So our engineers, um, Bura Hapold, designed a new steel intervention to relieve the, the stresses and the strains of the, the body by transferring her load um, down these struts and ties into the ground. So what we've done here, it's actually like an inverted uh, coat hanger. Um, we have 12 pairs of, of struts, each are physically connected by a new beam that runs underneath the, the tween deck and they are then picked up by these McElroy bars which come down and pick up a steel plate which is wrapped around the recessed keel so that we don't um, 
give viewers a sort of distortion of, of, of the profile of the ship. It's worth saying the false keel was last replaced in, um, or just before the First World War in, in 1913, so it was not an original uh, fabric. So that's the, uh, the new uh, intervention system that we have uh, put into the ship. And, and here she is um, back in April of this year, <coughs> um, shortly before we lifted it. Look at this. This is what I think of as the blade of Katisart. That's the cutting edge. That's what ploughed through the water. Absolutely striking image of the vessel before we lifted it. You can see uh, the, the dry berth around her, this, this stepped uh, structure. You can actually also see the, the temporary stillwork that went in place prior to the lifting of the ship. And although you may need to take um, me on oath here, uh, what we did was the, um, the jacks that lifted the ship were about uh, this deep. And there's a jack, whoops, um, well, there's a jack um, sitting here at the moment. And they built these sort of like Genga towers all the way along the, the ship. So as, as the ship was jacked up, another piece of, of timber uh, went in. And uh, there she is. That, that was the ship at the end of that process once we'd transferred her load onto the new support system. So, and uh, from, the, uh, from the stern, you can see that we physically lifted her from uh, this concrete altar here that she'd been sitting on for just over 50 years. And that distance there is about three and a half metres. And that provides her with support all round. And it also creates what I think is a completely new and unique experience. We have quite literally lifted Cutty Sark into the 21st century. For the first time, visitors will actually be able to walk underneath, alongside and around a three-masted sailing ship and, and see her incredible shape, the very thing that made her successful. As I've said, the single most significant thing about Cutty Sark is her hull. Raising the ship um, also relieves about a thousand square meters of space under the ship, opening up the dry berth for a truly awe-inspiring experience, showcasing the beautiful lines of this record-breaking ship and giving a wonderful new perspective on the design of the 19th century clipper. This visual illustrates how we're planning to use the space for interpretation. Uh, in the foreground here uh, is the Star of India. If I actually go back a, a couple of <coughs> slides. Um, when the ship was dedicated by the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh in 1957, uh, there was a, a Morris Lambert sculpture that was cast in concrete and mounted on the wall there with dedication stones either side. And, and this is going back to the point that I made earlier, that... that Cutty Sark, well, one of the big reasons it was saved was because at that time they thought it would be the last of the tall ships. Um, they didn't foresee then the sort of flowering of interest in, 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 in tall ships. But more importantly, it was as a memorial to the merchant marine. Um, and what we've done is to, uh, because that's now um, behind our new structure, we've taken a laser scan of that. And uh, rather like the uh, tomb of the unknown warrior, it's going to be uh, in a new suspended floor. You can still see the, the step structure, but what we're actually doing is putting a new floor um, into the bottom of the dry berth. And you can also see that we're overlaying the, 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 um, the lines of the ship so that you get a sense of that. And in the, the background here, um, what we call a choir 
of figureheads. For those of you who visited the ship uh, before the project began, you may remember that uh, there were a large number of figureheads down in the, the lower hold. That was because uh, back in the 50s, huge amounts of effort and work had gone into restoring the ship. And then uh, they woke up, I think, pretty late on in the day uh, to realise that when they'd be welcoming the public on board, they didn't really have anything to show. And uh, there was a public appeal made, and a man called Sidney Cumbers stepped forward with a huge collection of maritime material, ship models, paintings. And this collection of figureheads, it's the world's largest collection of merchant ship uh, figureheads. Uh, there are um, uh, in excess of 80. And we're going to display them uh, in association with the Star of India and our own figurehead, Nanny. Um, when the ship was restored in the 1950s, a new figurehead was, was made for the ship. The original will be down here taking centre stage in that, in that display. When we open um, at Easter next year, public access to the ship will be a, through a, a small aperture in the, the lower hold. So we've actually removed two frames. There's the edge of the timber there, you see? And that's actually the side of a, of a frame. So that you'll be coming on board and into the lower hold, and then you'll work your way up through the, uh, the ship. Egress is going to be by means of this uh, tower here. Uh, in Katisart Gardens, which will contain lifts and, and stairs. It has to be said that the, the tower has not won unreserved approval, um, <laughs> but it meets the fire regulations, and very importantly, it, it facilitates disabled access on and off the, uh, the ship. Um, it's worth saying, you know, before we started this programme, the only access for somebody in a wheelchair, for example, was onto the, the tween deck. And just to give you a sense that this is um, the, the gangway, so you'll, you'll come off through an opening in the bulwarks, which um, was damaged historically. So we've, we've just removed that panel, we've kept it. So the idea is you'll work your way up through the ship and exit by this gangway, come down the tower, and then you break out and have this extraordinary view underneath the ship. More than typhoons, more than the storms around Cape Horn, it has been salt which has threatened the survival of, uh, of Katisark. Salt absorbed through the sea and through the 300 tonnes of ballast that she uh, carried in her hold, which has corroded the, uh, the ship. In order to develop an answer how we were going to conserve Cutty Sark, we have uh, to become experts in the corrosion of, of wrought iron and the treatment of decaying timbers. But this has never been a project about repairing the ship or restoring the ship. Our project is about conserving Cutty Sark, <laughs> of ensuring that the, the fabric that travelled to the South China Seas that sailed around Cape Horn on its way back from uh, Australia is still with us throughout the 21st century. There has been a persistent and highly vocal lobby uh, who cannot understand why we don't just cut out the rusted parts of the frames and insert new pieces of, of steel. This is a legitimate aim, but it's one that we've rejected. This would mean that, that one day we would be effectively building uh, a replica I think a replica by stealth. Instead, our aim is to preserve as much of the original fabric as possible. We want to be able to, uh, to save as much of the, uh, the ship's timbers that sailed um, to the South China Seas that was the record breaker as, as possible. That, for me, is the essence of what Cutty Sark is, her 19th century hull timbers and, indeed, her, her raw time frames. This, this slide shows the interior of the, the lower hold. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if I can just break out here, everything painted white <coughs> is, 
is original structure. These are her original frames. These, this is the original cross bracing. These are original stanchions. These are the original beams. Um, what you can see in addition to that is the new steel that we've inserted. There are two types of steel. There are the, the sister frames. Uh, and there is the steel work that relates to the, um, the, the new intervention. What we've done is we've inserted a metal steel plate along the um, midship sections on the port and starboard side that the struts bolt into and then connect on through to the, um, onto the struts. And I'm just looking to see if I can't actually see a McAloy um, bar in that frame. The point that I want to make is predominantly, and this is where the worst of the corrosion is, you will see the original structure of Cutty Sark. There's nothing hidden. What, what is original will be on, on display. And, and frankly, substantially more than 90% of the, the hull of the, the ship is as built. A salutary reminder of the fire. I thought I'd, I'd show you this photograph of, of what the hull, um, the lower hull, hold looked like uh, the day after the fire. That's actually someone from the police carrying out um, investigation. And, uh, and this is a photograph taken earlier this, this summer uh, before we put the um, lower hold deck in. Uh, hopefully you can see uh, the, uh, the, the difference. And again, predominantly, I know we've got scaffolding planks there, but predominantly what you see is the original structure. These are, oops, these are the, um, the McAloy bars coming down from that steel strake to pick up the, uh, the keel at the bottom. And these are the, the bottoms of the, uh, the new beams that we've put in. It's not, actually, I, I, perhaps it's worth saying, our conservation plan, just so you get a sense of the preparation that was done for this project, it's 975 pages uh, long. Um, we needed to understand the history of absolutely every element of the ship and to assess its condition um, before we, uh, we began. So it's not simply then a question of treat treating the, the, the rust or consolidating uh, decaying timbers. It's about providing a future for the, for the ship. After all, there's, there's little point in investing millions and millions of pounds in, in treatments, in strengthening, in repairs, in consolidation, if there's no plan in place to ensure that the ship is a viable visitor attraction as well. We see the, the business plan as being an integral part of the, the conservation plan. It's not the driver, but, but it is the operational blueprint to ensure Cutty Sark will remain one of London's major visitor attractions and more, that it will have the ability to attract new audiences, new income streams, to provide a substantial uh, reserve to guarantee its long-term future maintenance needs. And what I want to do now is just to walk you through a few of the, the visuals um, that have been produced earlier on in the planning phase, to, just to give you a sense of what you'll see when you come on board. Access to the ship now will be by means of this, this new gangway into the, the lower hold. Um, this is a lenticular screen, it's just indicative, but uh, what we're trying to do before people board the ship is give them some sort of sense of what the world of 1869 was actually like, um, what books people read, what paintings, what um, music they, they listened to, what, what the world politics were like, what the, the, the map of the world was, uh, was like, what, what inventions uh, were, were happening at the time Cutty Sark uh, was, was being launched. This is just a, to give you a flavour of, of the, the space when you come into the, the lower hold. One of the things that I was very particular about is that anything that we did, um, you may have got a sense of this already from the white and the grey paint, 
Um, but, but what I particularly want to make uh, clear is, is what is new and what is original. When, when I um, went back on board the, the ship when I took this job, I found it very difficult to differentiate between work that had been done in the 1950s and the original structure of the ship. And that was because it had taken on a patina of its own that, that made it look as if it was part and parcel of the, the vessel. It had these wonderful companionways, for example. And, and, and it was very obvious that many people who went on the ship thought that, that there would be crew and passengers who were living down below. Not the case. So um, I, I, I've put a, a sort of uh, steel deck into the lower hold. But actually what we're doing is we're covering it in tea chests. And there'll be tea chests above you and around you. And we're looking here at the idea of Cutty Sark, the trader. We're looking at the cargoes that she carried. Particularly in the lower hold, we're looking at uh, tea. And, and I'm very keen that we're assaulting the senses when you go. So when you enter the ship, you'll actually smell the tea. Uh, I'm also hoping that you'll have a sense that you will be leaving dry land behind you. In, in places, we're, we're literally sloshing the lights up and down the inside of the, the hull just to, to try and, and give a sense of, um, of, uh, of atmosphere and colour to the space. So this, the lower hold is, is, is quite a, a darker atmospheric space, right at the heart uh, there'll be an introductory film and we'll be able to switch quite quickly between daytime mode and having a theatre for 100 uh, people literally right at the, the heart of the ship underneath the, uh, the main hatch so that the, the ship can become uh, a, a very important community resource. You can have uh, a little play or a concert or a comedy club or a lecture or a product launch, what, whatever, happening in this space. But um, quite atmospheric. I mean, up here, for example, you'll, you'll just see the sort of shadows of stevedores moving and, and packing the, the tea into the lower hold. Just to remind you, oh, there's one of the companionways um, that, that looks as if it was part of the original structure of the ship. Here's a view of the tween deck um, before we began the project. And um, it's, this was the full extent of the public space because behind the, uh, the camera, we lost more than a third of the deck for offices and uh, workshops. And even down at the, um, just here, um, to, to the sort of front of the aft uh, bulkhead, there was a shop which went right the way uh, across the uh, beam of the, the ship. And then we've got all these wonderful panels which kind of block the view. So what we're trying to do is open this space up. It's going to be much lighter. We'll have a, a, a gentle wash of, 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 of white lights up the, um, the walls of the ship. And we're going to try and preserve all of the sort of key views of the, the structure. Um, this will be more um, museum orientated. It will be looking at Cutty Sark, the Voyager. There are a lot of interactives um, that we are, are using in here. And we're, we're trying, um, I mean, they're, they're, we want to get away from labels on the walls, but there will be quite a lot of information available having said that. We'll project big images onto the walls of the ship. So there'll be key messages that you'll see sublimely. There'll be uh, digital touch tables, there'll be hard copy manuals. Um, we're also developing a cross-platform smartphone app for those who have that technology. We're not pr proposing to actually hand out uh, headsets to people. Um, I, I have a personal abhorrence of locking myself away in, in headphones. I think there's a place for that, particularly when you're listening to a, a curator telling you about a painting, for, it, for example. But I hope that coming to uh, Cutty Sart will be a social experience and you'll be able to talk and engage and, and hear things. So with the smartphone um, technology, some very clever things that can be done now using um, virtual reality, for example. So, you know, you can take a photograph of yourself once you've downloaded the free app either before you come to the ship or on the ship 
and then depending on what route you've elected to, to take, if you're a child, you can follow a route and uh, the, uh, the captain's monkey, Captain Woodgut, had two monkeys on board the ship. And you'll see them through the lens of your camera, scampering around, leading you on, pointing you to the, to the children's trail. But here, for example, you might stand and point your phone and you can look through the walls of the ship and actually see the sea beyond. When you're down in the, the dry berth, you can look up at the metal sheathed hull and see through and see the, the structure revealed. So very clever technology that um, is being employed here. The, the, the weather deck will be for that purpose. I mean, uh, we're not going to try and protect people. Um, uh, you, know, you need to experience the weather, but we'll be looking here at how the, the ship was sailed. Um, there are still devices to appeal to a wide audience, so uh, you could pick up a pair of what we call magic binoculars and, and look out and see Canary Wharf or look down onto the river, and then suddenly you'll find you're looking at icebergs um, as you're going around Cape Horn, or instead of looking at the HSBC building in, um, in Canary Wharf, you're looking at the HSBC building in, in Shanghai in, in, in the 1870s. And, and then here, just a, another view, once you break out underneath the ship, this, this particular one is uh, overtaken by events. It does show a lift, for example, here, which is now being relocated off to the side. And, and this previously is where I, my slide that I showed you where the choir of um, figureheads uh, will be standing. And you're looking up at the geodesic uh, dome here. This is a double glazed structure. Um, these glass panels lean out at exactly nine degrees centigrade. Nine degrees centigrade, nine degrees. Um, which means that wherever you're standing, there is no glare or reflection. So either close up or from a distance, the, uh, the ship is not obscured. What this actually does, though, is protect the, the hull and the interior of the, the ship. And it also allows us to air condition the whole space. So we've not only transferred the loads out of the ship, but we're actually protecting her from the worst of the... Um, the weather. Um, here's a little interactive screen. Um, uh, I was talking just before we started about having things at children's level. This is a little seabed that will be animated. Um, but you'll also be able to sit down here on, on teak seats and, and hear the life of the Cutty Sark being played out in a sound landscape. You'll, you'll hear her being built, you'll hear her launched, you'll hear her at sea. Um, and behind us, there'll be a cafe where you can um, sample the, the teas that the, the ship carried. But also, very importantly, um, there will be a Cutty Sark at night experience. We will be able to, to host events and do silver service dining for 320 uh, guests. So this, too, will be a very important income stream to ensure that over time we can build the reserves so that in 50 years' time, um, when perhaps there's no Heritage Lottery Fund available to help us, we won't have to go out with a, a begging bowl. We will have ensured that there is sufficient financial resource to be able to look after the ship ourselves. Our conservation plan, then, for the ship is not a final solution. We have always planned on the basis that after this project, the ship will need uh, further, further work. Uh, we have to plan to generate surpluses from our earnings to provide a substantial contribution to her future. Planning for 50 years in engineering terms is pretty impossible to predict, so we've instigated research and development in partnership with the University of Greenwich to create a mathematical model uh, on insidious decline so that we can begin to predict over time how the fabric is going to behave and take steps accordingly to uh, conserve her. 
The importance of business planning has perhaps not always been fully understood in the heritage sector, but I hope that you can see now what we are trying to achieve. Cutty Sark must live not just as a tourist attraction, but as an icon of London, as a venue, literally as a flagship. And I hope you can see from this uh, brief presentation what we are trying to achieve. These are the qualities of the ship and of our new interpretation scheme. She is, after all, a business machine, and we need to ensure that she remains highly competitive in the market for 21st century visitor attractions. In conclusion, may I say that if you visited the ship before, then I hope you will see that you simply have to come back and see the differences between Cutty Sark five or six years ago and what we will have achieved now in terms of telling her stories. Thank you very much.